scripture reading today of God's Word is Galatians 1, 3 through 6. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Children's Church, you guys can be dismissed. This, fix this. Don't look better now. Okay. We don't want to see your chest hair. Just the one. <laughs> Father, we humbly come before your throne today to give you the honor and praise and glory that you alone deserve. Lord, we come to worship you. May we bring our hearts to you, Father, for all the things that you have done. For you are mighty and worthy. Your plans and your ways are perfect in every way. Father, we don't see that so many times because we don't have the understanding. But you have revealed part of that mystery to us through Jesus Christ if we have chosen to believe. Lord, I just thank you for loving us. And I pray that each one here knows the peace that surpasses all understanding. If there's someone here that doesn't know today that you reveal yourself to them, Father, that they may come home. Bless this service today for it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, Merle read Galatians 1, 3 through 6. I'm not sure if you heard some of the things that he mentioned, but it said, we have grace and peace. Sometimes we look in the world today and we see all the bad things going around and we say, where is God? But what would this world be like if there wasn't God present here? If He wasn't a part of our lives, if He didn't love us the way He loves us? Grace and peace is how Paul starts this letter off because that's what we have in Christ. Peace that surpasses all understanding, grace and mercy that we don't deserve because we're sinners. We deserve death. We sinned against God Almighty. Think of it this way. What if you sinned against a powerful dictator or king? What would you deserve? You can think about it and think what the punishment would be. What if you sinned against a demigod or a god, something that had a superman that had powers beyond what we can believe and comprehend, what would your punishment be? But we've sinned against the God that spoke and created stars with his breath, that created life that could reproduce and heal itself, that created all the wonderful things that we see and enjoy in this world because he chose to, because it was his will, because he loved us. That's who we sinned against. And we deserve eternal separation and punishment for that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what do we deserve? We deserve to be punished. But instead, He gives us grace. Is there anything we can do about that? Nothing. We have sinned. There's nothing we can do. We can beg and plead, but there's nothing that we can do. We have to have a God that is gracious and loving enough to pardon us. And we can't do that on our own <clears throat> because we are imperfect. We are sinners. So God had a perfect plan. It was His will all along before the beginning of creation. He knows everything and His will was to send His one and only Son to die for our sins, to die in our place, to pay our sin debt once and for all. Jesus humbled Himself, came to this earth, gave up His deity so that He could rescue us. He was on a rescue mission something that we could not do of ourselves, to save us, but not only to save us, but to sanctify us, to make us holy, to set us apart for a task that we have been given. Once we get saved, it doesn't mean we're just saved and we know it, amen. It means we're saved and let's talk about it. Let's do something about it. Let's live a life that shows. Let's be a light to the world. Let's give. Let's love as Jesus loves so that people can see the love of our Father. God wanted to reconcile us back to Him. He created us in the first place. We belong to Him, but we chose to leave Him. We said we don't need Him. We said our ways are better than Him. 
but He chose to reconcile us back, and that could only be done through Jesus Christ. And not only did He reconcile us, but He adopted us as His own children. That we have all rights as a child of God. There's nothing kept from us. Wow, grace and peace to us, right? And that's what Paul's trying to tell them. <clears throat> and that's why we worship God, for who He is and what He does. The title of this message is, Why Do We Worship? How can we not worship? But sometimes we get so easily distracted, don't we? That's why Paul was astonished, as Merle read. He was astonished, he was amazed, he was perplexed, and probably very irritated with Christians who said, Yes, I believe, but my actions don't show it. My faith doesn't show it. My light's sh there, but it's weak and not shining like it should be. I should be praising God with all of my heart, all of my body, all of my soul. And the ironic thing, Paul's in prison when he writes this to him. Paul's in prison in a lot of the letters that he wrote. He's telling him of the peace that he has. The peace that surpasses all understanding. That his strength comes from Christ. Who wants to spend an eternity in torment in hell? No one. No one wants to join me, right? So it's easy to say, yes, I don't want that. Sure, I want Jesus Christ. But we need to be a light to the world so they can see, that others may see how we are supposed to act and behave as sons and daughters of the Most High. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So yes, we might say, hey, yes, I want to sign up. Where do I sign up? I want this. I want this salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. But are you willing to give up your life for His? Is Jesus' sacrifice, God's love, mean to you what it should? That's what Paul's trying to say. Do you understand how great God is? Do you understand the things that He did for you? Every single one of you. How much He loved you. And the price that you don't have to pay that His Son paid once and for all for you. Do you love your life too much? Or do you love what Jesus did for you? He gave His life for you. Are you willing to give your life for Him? Are you willing to worship Him? Or do you worship yourself? See, we don't have a problem worshiping. We were designed to worship. God made us that way. The problem we have is what do we worship? Who do we worship? Do we worship just God on Sunday and then through the week we don't worship Him? Do we worship God when things are going good, but when things are tough, we fall apart? We fall away from Him? Paul was persecuted. Paul was killed. But he didn't give up his faith. He realized what God did for him. He persecuted and killed God's people. But God had a plan for him. He had a plan to bring life instead of death to someone who destroyed. The Jews were scared, and the Gentiles were scared of him. And isn't this the man who killed us? But God had a plan to use him to show God's will, God's might, God's love. From the Amplified Bible, <clears throat> Galatians 1, 3 through 6 reads this way, Grace to you and peace, which is an inner calm and spiritual well-being, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself as a sacrifice to atone for our sins, to save and sanctify us, so that He might rescue us from this present evil age, in accordance with His will and purpose and plan of our God and Father. To Him be ascribed, <clears throat> to him be ascribed all the glory through the ages of the ages. Amen. I am astonished and extremely irritated that you are so quickly shifting your allegiance and deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ <clears throat> for a different or even contrary gospel. See, what we have is contrary to the world. The world says we don't need God. The world says I can get to God. The world says it doesn't matter which God you serve. But we teach that contrary, and it is a mystery to those. It is foolishness. The cross is foolishness to them. Why would God do this? But you can see if you're a Christian why He did, how much love He has. I say it many times, but if you're a, a good earthly father, you'll understand a little glimpse of that. What it means, how much you love your child and you want the best for them. 
You don't want them to go through the pain and suffering. You want to do everything that you can for them. But they make their own decisions. <clears throat> it's time for Christians to start acting like Christians, right? I mean, that would help, wouldn't it? When Beth was here, she said she didn't like to be called a Christian because of the connotations, especially where she's at, that that means. Because Christians aren't necessarily nice people. They're definitely not necessarily like Christ. They're not putting a light in this world. We were saved and called for a much higher purpose than to just sit quietly and be grateful for our salvation. We were made to worship, to shout out, why would a God love us so much? Because of who He is and how much He loves. That despite my sin and my shame, he chose to love me. Enough to redeem me back at the cost of his son's life. Why would I not worship and praise him? So last week we talked about the mystery of God's will and how it's not a mystery anymore. Yes, certain things are. and Revelation comes through God's word, through the empowerment of the Spirit, and that's why we need to study. We need to praise. We need to meditate. We need to pray to God. We need to seek his face. But he doesn't want to be hidden from us. He wants to be known. The more we seek Him, the Word tells us that we will find Him. The more we follow and set our lives after the, past, after the pattern of Jesus Christ, the more that we will find God the Father. Because we have a heavenly Father, not just a God. Through Jesus Christ and in Christ, we have a personal relationship with our Abba Father, our Daddy, so, who loves us so much and wants the best for us. So why do we worship? It's pretty obvious. The problem is, like I said, what distracts us from our worship? What are our things focused on? How quickly do we fall away and forget about all of the things that God has done for us? If anyone should forget, maybe it's Paul, but he doesn't forget. He continues to tell all of those, this is why we are here. Because God loved us, He chose us, He called us, He adopted us, He saved us. God is the only thing worth worshiping. We've just got to just figure out what are we worshiping and what are we willing to do about it. Romans eleven thirteen, or excuse me, Romans thirteen eleven through fourteen says this, and do this. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And then jumping down to verse, chapter 14, verse 2. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now these aren't my words. These aren't Paul's words. These are God's words to you. Do you understand this present time? We are living in a sinful world, a fallen world, a world that rejected God Almighty and will be punished for all of eternity. And we're called to say something and do something about it. Because God loved us so much from the beginning of time before time that He chose us. He predestined us for this calling and He gave His Son's life up to accomplish this. What we could not do on our own. That's how much He loves us. Why would we not scream out God loves us so, so much. He is the one that is worthy of our worship. Paul also says this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You will be accountable every thought and every action. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that to say, 
<clears throat> as Paul is. We have a limited amount of time. Let's get busy, guys. There are souls in the balance. I'm not worried necessarily about the things that I've done. I'm worried about the things I can do for Christ. He gave me His Spirit. He said it is better for me to leave here so that I can empower you with the Spirit so that you can do mightier things than I have done while I'm here. And as a body, think about what we can do that much more. That's why Jesus said, I am establishing my church so that we can be even a bigger light to this world. It's tough doing it on our own, but when we've got this many people to help us when we do fall, to help us pick us back up, to help us in jobs that we couldn't get done on our own, to spread the gospel message better, we are a body united in Christ, and all of us has our specific functions. All of us are empowered by the same Spirit. So look at back, looking back at Romans eleven thirteen, do you understand the present time? Do you understand what we're living in and the repercussions of our fallen state? Do you understand the important role that you have, the privilege that you have for having this role? God sanctified us and set us apart as a holy people with a purpose to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ, to tell how much the Father loves His children. And we're all God's children. The thing is that some of us still need to come home. And we need to help show them the way. So Paul says in here, wake up. You're asleep. Wake up, guys. It's time. Don't sit here and be content in your salvation. Do something about it. We're running out of time. It's closer than you think. Salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is nearly over. So what can we do in the nighttime? Shine. Bring light to the darkness so that people don't stumble, that people don't fall, that people don't get trapped in the darkness when the light is removed. The day is almost here. A time coming when we are being redeemed as sons and daughters of God. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, you can't put aside the deeds of darkness unless you're doing the deeds of darkness, right? And Paul goes on to say, let us behave decently as in daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Well, pastor, I don't do all those things, right? Well, I think jealousy was in there. Come on. You don't have to do it, but join with me. I might not do the other things, but sin is sin, guys. We have all fallen. We all deserve punishment. You may not be as bad as your brother. Well, thank goodness for the grace of God, because the grace of God can save anyone, can it? You too and your bigotry. Oops, sorry. We are all sinners saved by grace. There's nothing we have done. It's all because of God. He deserves our worship and our praise. And it says, do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. Well, we don't do that either, do we? Okay, I'll use myself as an example. I love to eat. God gave us taste buds. I love a good meal. It's one of the biggest pleasures that I have in life. But what happens if you, that becomes your idol? You become a glutton, obese. It kills you, literally kills you. If that's not a good enough example, I'll give you another personal example. I'll pull them out of my closet so you can see my openness. I serve God. I love God. I want to tell others about Jesus Christ, about the sonship that is awaiting them. And I serve out of a loving heart for God. But if you remember a few years ago, there was a summer where you didn't see me once for you guys that were here. Because that summer, I was more worried about fishing and hunting and ATVs and horseback riding. I wasn't here. My priorities were a little mixed up. Did I still pray? Did I still read my Bible? Yep. Did I spend time with my family in prayer? Yep. But was I a part of my church, which Paul says, let us to not forsake meeting regularly? No, I wasn't. There might have been someone here that needed me, something that I had to offer, because I'm a part of this body. And I'm, God may have had a plan for me, and I wasn't here. So what was I doing? Let me see, it reads right here. Think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. I believe that's what I was doing, wasn't it? Paul tells us not to do that. It's hard. God created this world for us to enjoy. He didn't create it bad. He created it good for us to enjoy. 
We just got to remember not to enjoy the creations more than the Creator. We've got to remember who He is and what He did for us. I'm not saying those things are bad. Don't mix up my words. I'm not saying I'm not going fishing or hunting again because I am, good Lord willing. But I'm going to try to not let it be more important to me than His will. Not my will, but yours. Jesus taught us how to pray that way. So what do we do? How can we do anything about this? Well, we read last week in Ephesians, and we're going to look at that some more in a minute. But I want to give you one more story first. Think of it this way. Maybe it'll give you a little better understanding. Suppose I was king of the world. I had all power, all authority, and I heard about this little child, this orphan child in this country that was going to be put to death. And I decided I wanted to, rec to rescue him. There was nothing this child could do on my own. So I talked with my son, and I sent my son out on this rescue mission. When he gets there, he finds out the only way the child is going to be released is if he dies in his place. Hmm. Well, now let me tell you more about this story. This little child has grown up. He's not a little child anymore. He's a full-grown man, and he's murdered a bunch of people. Changes the story a little bit, doesn't it? Well, we sinned against God, didn't we? And my son's got to die for this man, not for this little orphan child, but this man who has murdered people. But I still decide that I love this man enough that I am going to do this for, the, for this man. And my son knows my will. He knows that plan, and it's his will also. Because it's his will, his, my will over his will. And he decides to die in that man's place. Now the reason that I wanted to do this was not only to save this man, but I had a purpose for this man. I wanted to adopt him as my own child, but I also wanted for him to tell others about what I did for him. And I wanted to receive them into my kingdom as well and treat them as my own children, to adopt them also. Now what if that son came home? He was saved. He came home but he never told anyone about that. Look at the tragedy there. He would be saved. He would have every right and privilege, but he wouldn't have told others about Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility as Christians, to be like Christ, to follow after the ways of our Master, our Teacher, and our Lord, so that we can present the Gospel message, so that we can tell others of the love that they have. And if we think this is a tough world to do it in, you're right. Even more reason for them to know about the love that God has for them. God loves them beyond what we can comprehend. It is a mystery to them. But in Christ, they can have sonship. They can have redemption. They can be saved. On the back of your bulletins, I've jotted that down a little bit just so we can look at it and remember it. Because of God's love and will, Jesus humbled Himself. He died in our place to pay our sin debt so that we would be saved, rescued, set free from our sin debt, reconciled, sanctified, adopted. But don't forget the next one. We were appointed. What did you do? Nothing. You believed. The cost wasn't that great for you, was it? But Jesus humbled Himself. That means He gave up heaven, His throne. He gave up His power. He died in our place. He took all of mankind's sin on His shoulders. He was separated from God the Father because of sin. He did all of that so that we could tell others how worthy is God our Father and the Lamb. Holy and worthy are you, God Almighty, and worthy, except I spelled it wrong, is Jesus, the Lamb that was slain for me. So even in my imperfections, we can praise Him. God is the one who deserves our praise. He wants to reconcile us. That means put us back into a right relationship. And He wants to sanctify us, which means to set us aside for a specific job. We've been purchased with a price. Paul quite often uses the term bondservant. It means you have no rights. You have been purchased. You belong to whoever purchased you. God purchased you back through the blood of His Son.
His son had to die so that you might live. And that living starts today when you accept Jesus Christ. It doesn't start when you enter heaven. We're learning how to be sons and daughters of the King here on earth. We're learning to be like Christ here on earth. Not when we get to heaven. So it's time for Christians to start what? Acting like Christians. Ephesians 1.1 said, <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, we see that, to the saints, that's what he calls the Christians at Ephesus or wherever he's writing to. Saints. The word saint is related to sanctification. Both words have to do with holiness. You are holy and righteous because you took on Jesus' holiness. You remember in Revelation where he tells the churches that aren't obeying and acting the way they should to take on and buy from me. and You'll be clothed in robes of white, robes of righteousness. It's not because of anything we've done, but we are not accountable and we are instead righteous and holy because of what God's done. God's perfect will for me, a sinner, to be called a saint. And if you think back in Paul's times, that was controversial calling these people saints. If we look back in Old Testament, a saint was somebody highly, highly regarded that you knew that they were doing God's will. But through Jesus Christ, all of us are saints. All of us are adopted children. All of us will not face eternal damnation. All because of Jesus Christ. If you read through Ephesians, you'll see constantly that you'll see the two words, in Christ. We have so much to be thankful because of what the Father's done through Jesus Christ. Wow. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influ influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom for God. There's not mystery anymore. We have wisdom. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. May we worship and praise God, not our own lives, not our own sinful desires. May we do His will rather than our own. Worship belongs only to God. So I'll ask this question again. Who are you worshiping? Looking back at Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to go through verse 14. If you remember, I said verses 3 through 14 were all one big sentence, one song of praise that Paul was saying, guys, listen up. Here's what it's all about. This is what all God did for you. He planned it from before the knowings of time. It involves you. He loves you. It's all possible through Jesus Christ. You see the involvement of the Trinity. You see the Father's love. You see the Son's sacrifice. And you see the Spirit that seals us, empowers us. So I'm going to read through verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people or saints in the King James... In Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through, Christ, through Jesus Christ in accordance with His will and pleasure, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ to be into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, 
to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And here Paul continues, In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, when you believed. You were marked with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, with a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. Maybe you noticed in there how many times that in Christ or in Him were mentioned. Maybe you noticed in there how many times praise was mentioned, that we should praise God, that we should praise Jesus Christ. And hopefully you mentioned in those last verses how you were sealed and adopted. You belong to God. And He gave you part of Him to seal the deal as a down payment, as earnest money, showing ownership. God's will has been revealed to the Christian and we've been empowered by the Spirit. But we see some things in there that might confuse you a little bit. So we're going to look at them. God chose us. He predestined us. And oh yeah, the confusing thing to a lot of us is we belong to Him. It's His will, not ours, right? It's His plan, His purpose, not ours. But God chose us. He predestined us. Does that mean we don't have a choice? Not at all. It says when we believe. Does that mean that we don't need to go out and spread the gospel message because those who are predestined to be saved will be saved? God chose them anyway? No, it doesn't say that at all. I have a right as a father to adopt any child I choose. Doesn't mean that any of the other children should gr grumble or complain about it. It means that I decided to adopt that child. And when I adopt that child, I take them in as my very own. It's my right as a father. And from the child's point of view, Wow, that the Father would love me enough to adopt me. Why would He want me? I'm a ragged little orphan child or whatever it may be. But He chose to love me. The thought of predestination is not a thing that should be thought of in a negative way at all. To think that God would choose me before the beginning of time. And we don't know who He's chosen and not chosen. We don't know anything else there. But to be chosen to be a child of God... How could I not tell someone about it? And He might be choosing them as well and He might be calling you to take that message to them. Predestination isn't tough if you look at it from God's side. He chooses to love you. Wow, what a concept. If you look in those verses too, you will see that plan, that mystery. Verses 4 through 6 talks about adoption by the Father. How? Verses 7 through 12 say we were redeemed by the Son. Because the first verses talk about predestination and adoption. And then we are sealed, guaranteed that adoption in the verses 13 through 14. This is God's perfect will and plan. And to Him belongs all praise and honor. Verse 11 said, In Him, meaning Jesus Christ, we were chosen. God chose us. In fact, He predestined us. That's what it says. That means we have a destiny. So not only are you saved with a mission, but you have a destiny. That kind of changes the way you look at it a little bit. Given to, God, given to you by God, your Father. It is His will, His purpose and plan that you have a destiny. It's not your plan. It's not your will. It's His. Everything is according to His purpose and will. But if we read on, we'll see that it is our choice there. In order that we... We have been set on a mission. We are ambassadors in this world where we don't belong. This is not our home. To a dark world that soon the light is coming. We have a mission to tell others about Jesus Christ so that they can be redeemed. They can be adopted as a son and daughter. We were the first to put our hope in Christ for the praise of His glory. And you were also included. This wasn't something just for the Jews. It wasn't just something for the Gentiles of the church. It was a personal experience for every single one who would choose to believe. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, when you believed. 
you still have to believe. You still have to choose. How would they have heard and believed if Paul wouldn't have went and told them? How will whoever God is calling you to take the gospel message to hear and believe if you don't go? Sure, someone else might. But God's plan and will is for you. Your mission is your mission. You are the one who will be accountable for the things that you do. There won't be any he said or she said. There won't be any, but do you know what Susie did or Bob did? Sorry, Bob. I'll say another name. <laughs> it will be here's what I did or did not do. It won't matter what else anyone else did. And if someone else went to that person and they were there, they get the privilege and right to be the ones that shine the light that showed them the way home. You'll miss out on that. Those days of hunting and fishing and whatever things that consumed your will, that you wanted to gratify those desires, won't mean a thing. God has called you to live out His will in your life today. He's the one worth praising. And Him and Him alone. So if predestination bothers you, look at it as a privilege. If chosen bothers you, why in the world would that chose you? You can't get to Jesus Christ. Or you can't get to God. Only through Jesus Christ can you come. God is the one who deserves your praise, your honor, your worship. Romans 8.15 says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Don't ever feel that way so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba or Father. And like I said, this is something new in the New Testament. Because of what Jesus Christ did, because God sealed you through his spirit and made you his own very child, you can call him daddy. Plain and simple. You have that personal relationship. So why would you not tell others why you worship God? Looking at verses 4, 5, and 11 from Ephesians, it says this, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. So there is responsibility with the choice we make. In love He predestined us for adoption and sonship adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity for, with His purpose and will. Wow, the fact that He did choose and predestine us. And He called us to be a witness to the world. We have a responsibility. It's time for Christians to behave like Christians so that people of the world won't say, eh, I don't know about Christians. Maybe we need to start realizing how much more we are in Christ so that we can act more like Christians, more like Christ. God had a perfect plan, a perfect will. He loves each and every one of us, so we need to worship Him as He deserves. Yes, it's a mystery to some, but you have access to break that mystery, to knowledge and wisdom through Jesus Christ. And you're empowered by a Spirit who can do mightier things than what Jesus did here on, his, on the, the earth. He left you behind to share that gospel message. All praise, glory, and power, and honor be to God the Father and to Jesus Christ His Son. Father, we thank You so much that You loved us. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You that Jesus was obedient even to death for me. That You love me even before the begins of time and You love everyone here and everyone who's outside of these walls. You just want Your children to come home. You love them and You created them and You love them enough to purchase them back at the price of Your Son's life. A payment that was made once and for all and now we are sons and daughters of You, Father. We thank You for that that you would have this marvelous, wonderful plan from before time, and it would involve us. And it would involve spiritual and heavenly realms to bring everything in creation into your unity through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you and praise you. Help us to be a light to this dark world. The time is approaching when you will be returning. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to do everything in our power to give up our will, not our will, but yours, Father. Thy will be done, thy kingdom done. come on earth as it is in heaven, for it is your plan. Lord, strengthen us, show us the way. Help us to lay down those things that are our, our idols, those things that we desire in our flesh. Help us lay them down today so they won't be a hindrance. As Paul says, we have a race to run. Let us throw down any weight that will hinder us from participating in this race the way that we should. We thank you and praise you for you alone are worthy. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.